this is the very first photograph I ever took of a fish on the water. T exactly 20 years ago in a cold Norwegian fjord. And it's no coincidence that the species that I photographed is a gold cine wrasse, because the gold cine is a curious fish species. Here's gold cine checking out the cameras of a baited camera rig recently. It just needs to check out this novel thing that has landed smack into its environment. The notion that some fish are curious is not a new idea. But what does it mean? What kind of behaviors are fish capable of? And what are the implications for fishing? For a curious fish person like myself, tropical coral reefs teeming with life provide excellent opportunity to study fish behavior and address questions in ecology and evolution. Using scuba diving gear for a limited time, we can follow indivi individual fish and try to understand aspects of their behavior. I spent hours and hours following individual fish, taking notes on their behavior and categorizing it to understand what it is they're doing. And when I embarked on my, on my first proper research project 15 years ago, I directed my attention to a phenomenon known as mimicry. What is mimicry and what is fish mimicry? Well, mimicry is something fascinating. It's fish disguised as other fish. So fish taking on the appearance of another species. And these two fish may look alike, but in fact, they're two different species. One is a labrid, like our friend the gold cine wrasse from my first ever fish portrait, and the other is a blenny, the latter simply disguised as the former. And there are good reasons for that, because while the labrid, the lower fish in this picture, is the good guy, it's the cleaner fish, it cleans dead tissue and parasites of other fish on the, on the, on the coral reef, and it's thus providing a very important service. It plays an important role to the coral reef fish assemblage. The upper fish, the blenny, is the bad guy. He's a villain who bites pieces of skin and grabs mouthfuls of mucus off the surface of other fish that are attracted to the cleaner fish. And this so-called mimetic relationship is obviously advantageous to the mimic, otherwise this strategy would not have evolved. But I was curious to know just how strongly the mimic is depending on this relationship. How important is it really for it to fulfill this sort of this relationship to, a, to a, another fish. So we designed an experiment in which we removed the cleaner fish away from the mimic. And the results were surprising, except uh, besides having to work harder to feed itself, the mimic lost its, its coloration. It changed color and stopped being a, a cleaner fish mimic. So this supported our notion that mimicry in fish can be both flexible and opportunistic, not necessarily hardwired. In fact, the blue striped fang blenny is capable of taking on any suitable appearance. These tiny fish can make choice regarding when a behavior and a, an appearance pays off or not. When is it profitable to be a mimic? When is it not? Similar observations were made by colleagues and they simply concluded that the blue-striped fang blenny is choosing when to be a clear fish mimic. So the reasons why I've shown you these slides is that I wanted to take you into a, to the world of fish and, 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 and show you how fish can, be, can display curiosity, they can have curious behavior, they can be flexible and opportunistic, and they're capable of making choices regarding the most profitable behavior and appearance. 
But, th but does that really mean that fish are smart in the common sense of, uh, of the word? Are fish capable of truly innovative behavior? Can fish, for example, use a tool? Normally, or one, ex one um, definition of tool use is the artificial extension of the body. And in case of fish, that would mean grabbing an object with its mouth that could potentially be used as a tool. But here's a wonderful exception to that. In a self-feeding experiment with Atlantic cod, cod received food when pulling on a string with a rubber mouthpiece. And the fish in the experiment learned this quickly. Only problem was that while a cod was busy tugging on the string with its mouth and body weight, other fish would see this and they would rush in and get the food before the cod. All the cod in, in this particular experiment were equipped with a large, brightly colored, soft plastic bead attached to their backs in order for the movement of the fish to be monitored by video. And sometime into the experiment, a cod accidentally snagged the string and mouthpiece by the tag on its back. And while jerking free, it released the food. Only this time, the food was within reach to the cod. So this technique was perfected by this cod to go over to the string, snag it with their, uh, with their tag on their back, release the, the, the mechanism, and get the food. Two other cod learned the same technique in two independent tanks. So we actually have a, a case here of truly innovative behavior and, and, and cod taking advantage of an artificial extension of the body that normally would never happen in the natural world of fish. However, tool use is not unknown in wild fish either. Here's the uh, black spot tusk fish on the, on the Great Barrier Reef. And it has a fantastic habit. It, it, it knows about a favorite suitable rock in its, in, in its surroundings. And while eating seashells, it will pick up shells and clams held for, uh, and hold this firmly in their mouths and smash it against their favorite uh, animal rock and thus open the clam and get to the soft parts of the, um, of, of, of the seashell. So now, in addition, we've seen that fish are flexible, uh, they are opportunistic, they can also learn new skills. At the same time, fish can be incredibly fixed and predictable in their behavior. This is a be beautiful fish. It's a dusky parrotfish. The parrotfish uses its uh, fused beak-like set of teeth that have given name to the group to scrape algae and bacteria off dead coral rock. Last year, with my marine biologist colleague, Rene Abesamis, we tagged 20 dusky parrotfish on Apo Island in the Philippines. We wanted to study how parrotfish moved between living coral reef on the western side of Apo Island and coral destroyed by typhoons on the eastern side of Apo Island. Parrotfish go to sleep in coral crevices. And we also wanted to know whether parrotfish would prefer living coral for sleeping and whether they would make excursions to the impacted coral for feeding. In this film, we're tagging parrotfish with acoustic tags the size of a pen cap, which are placed in the gut cavity of fish where there's some extra space, and the wounds are closed with absorbable sutures, and the wound heals rapidly, and the fish is released in perfect condition. In contrast to the diver-based short-term observational work that I showed you previously in the talk, acoustic telemetry enables long-term observations of individual fish, which is fantastic because when you dive, you, you, you can collect a snapshot or, or, or you, can, you can get a short-term uh, perspective on behavior, but now we can really see what are the, 
what are these fish doing? What are they doing every day? What are they doing every night? So the tag that's inserted inside the belly of the fish emits ultrasound signals that are picked up by underwater antenna that are hydrophone receivers placed in the study area. Here's data from one of the fish in our study. And this particular dusky parrot fish pretty much behaved exactly according to our prediction. Every morning around 7.30 a.m., it will leave its nighttime residence on the western side and commute over to the eastern side where it would spend its day feeding. As can be inferred from the red columns of depth data in the graph. Late afternoon, around 5.30 p.m., the fish would return, commute back to the western side, and once tucked into its favorite coral crevice, the signals would be lost until next morning, as can be inferred from the daily gaps in data. And this behavior was repeated every day for the two months or, or so that the study went on. This type of recurring behavior is what we in everyday life would call a habit. But as behavioral scientists, we look for repeatability of behavioral traits. And we can measure how significant things are being repeated. In Atlantic Cod, we have been studying behavior quite a lot. And over the last few years, we've tagged hundreds of Atlantic Cod in, on the Norwegian Skagora coast with acoustic tags. And we have gained insight into their lives and fates. Importantly, though, we have found consistent individual differences in behavior. In the graph, I'm showing vertical and horizontal aspects of cod movement behavior that showed repeatability or consistency between the month of June and the three following months. Such consistencies in individual behavior can be termed personality. And differences in personality, in the case of cod, could be, for instance, a very active, exploratory cod, possibly bold, on one end of the scale, and at the other end of the scale, a shy, timid, passive individual. And we found the same uh, pattern in another of our study species, the European lobster. Question is, how do such individual differences in behavior play out when we expose fish to harvesting? This cartoon uses lobsters to illustrate the possibly dire consequences of having a personality characterized by curious, exploratory behavior. Passive fishing gears, such as traps, hooks, and nets, depend on the activity of the target species and a certain willingness to take risks. Because there's risk involved, clearly, with entering a trap or nibbling on a hook or on the bait of a hook, sampling it with your mouth. Curiosity probably plays a role, a role in this. In fact, curiosity, broadly, broadly taken as a widespread behavioral trait in fish, could be one of the main reasons why fishing actually works. In my career, we have really widened our horizon and, and widened our knowledge of fish. We have gained knowledge about fish behavior, and we've gained a lot of knowledge about how fish work. And that's changing the way we are thinking about fish, and it's changing the way we keep fish. In today's aquaculture and today's experimental labs, we think about things like environment enrichment, providing stimulating environment to the fish to lower their stress levels and play uh, the part of the biology of the fish. Next time you meet a fish, perhaps you'll meet it with the same curiosity as possessed by the, 
Goldsini Rass in my very first fish portrait. Thank you for diving with me. <laughs>